The most common mistake that students make on momentum problems with a moving control volume is to forget that the control volume is moving. You'd think that would be impossible to forget. It's the whole like point of the problem. But look at what I wrote here as my givens for this problem. I was given that the volumetric flow rate at A was 0.04, and that 3 fourths of the flow goes up to B and 1 fourth of the flow goes down to C. So I thought, oh, that's some easy math. I don't even need a calculator for this. Flow rate through B is 0.03 and flow rate through point C is 0.01. But that's all totally wrong. I didn't account for the fact that the control volume is moving. I forgot on the very first line. The flow rate that's provided is the flow rate leaving the nozzle, not the flow rate entering the control volume. Since the control volume is moving away from the nozzle, then the volume entering will actually be a little bit slower. Basically, velocity of the water minus velocity of the cart, you'll have to use that relative velocity to solve for your volumetric flow rate and therefore mass flow rate. So I'm gonna cross off this line, start drawing my control volume and try to keep it in the back of my mind for later that I'm interested in relative velocities for a moving control volume. All right, on my drawing, I'm adding a dashed line to indicate the control volume. I'm just including the cart and also the part of the water that's hitting the cart. But I'm being very particular to make sure I draw my control volume a little bit crooked so that everywhere that water enters and exits, it is perpendicular to the direction of the control volume. It doesn't seem like it should matter, but it kind of actually does. Next, momentum problems are force problems, just like F equals MA back in your dynamics class. Draw a free body diagram and a kinetic diagram. The free body diagram has all of your surface and body forces, and your kinetic diagram has all of your changes in momentum. That's your MA term, and also your m dot v terms for fluid entering or leaving the control volume. In the free body diagram, you just have weight pointing down, friction pointing back to the left, and there should also be a normal vector pointing upwards, right, from the ground, which I forgot to draw, but in this problem it ends up not mattering since we're only interested in the, the horizontal left to right direction. But yeah, there definitely should be an upward pointing normal force here. Over on the kinetic diagram side, I've got fluid entering the system pointing to the right, m dot a times v a. I've got some fluid exiting up and to the right, m dot b v b some fluid exiting down and left, m dot cvc, and the cart is moving at constant velocity, so I'm gonna add my ma term just because I add it to every problem, but I'm immediately gonna cross it off as zero because the control volume is not accelerating, so acceleration is zero. But I always put it on the drawing so I don't forget it in case there actually is an accelerating control volume. The derivation for the linear momentum equation that you'll use comes from the Reynolds transport theorem which is a stupidly complex, crazy, overcomplicated looking thing that you see on the screen here. So I've got a proposal. So if me and your TA Indy can help you understand this crazy looking equation, then I have down here Indy's second favorite treat, which are little uh, churu things, a little snack in a squeeze tube. If you think he's done a good job, then I will feed him his churu treat at the end. And hopefully you'll think that it's not actually as scary as it looks. Left-hand side, FB and FS, body forces and surface forces. Now, body forces are things like gravity or magnets. These forces act even over a distance on the entire body. That's why they're called body forces. And surface forces are exactly what they sound like. They are forces that act on a surface. So this would be things like the normal force or friction or gauge pressure. Since it requires actual physical contact, any normal external push or pull would be a surface force. Drag is a surface force being pushed by air. So an example with both would be a skydiver. They're being pulled down by gravity, which is a body force acting at a distance, and then they're being pushed up by the air, by drag, which is a surface force due to actual contact with the air. If you wanna see an example momentum problem that has gauge pressure acting as a force, then watch the video I have linked up here for fluid flow around a pipe elbow. So now onto the right hand side, all of these integrals. So the first one, you see an A term that's a vector. That term is mass times acceleration. Rho dV, that's density times volume, that's mass, right? So this integral is just a really complicated way of saying MA. So for this problem, we don't have any acceleration. You can completely ignore this MA term. 
Middle integral, the scariest looking one of all, since it's a partial time derivative of an integral over the control volume. What the heck even is this term? You can think of this as an accumulation term. The partial derivative with respect to time indicates that it's time-based. So if your problem is at steady state or steady flow, that lets you cross off and ignore this middle problem. And that'll probably be every momentum problem you'll have in this class will probably be steady flow. So my prediction is that every single time you will cross off this time derivative, partial derivative term, because you have steady flow. Last integral, bounds of integration are CS for control surface. This is all of your fluid entering or exiting across a surface. So the first V in this expression can be thought of as the velocity with like an X or Y component, depending on which direction velocity is pointing. And the last terms, rho V dA, right? That's like rho A V, density times area, times velocity, that's mass flow rate. So this whole last integral is just m dot v, where the dot product though is actually kind of important. And if I can convince you one more time, if you haven't already watched my video about a pipe elbow with the uh, momentum with a stationary control volume, I go into a lot more detail there about this dot product. But in short, this is why I said at the beginning of this video that it's vitally important to draw your control volume perpendicular to the direction of flow. It's because of this dot product. The area vector points straight outwards perpendicular to the control volume. So you want that pointing in the same direction as flow. That's why you draw it perpendicular. But the other thing it will do is it affects the sign convention that since the area vector points outwards, if your velocity is pointing outwards, then that's a positive mass flow rate because it's in the same direction as area. The dot product would be a cosine zero, right? A, B, cosine theta is dot product. So if theta is zero because the area and the velocity are pointing the same way, cosine theta is one and it's a positive term. But if area is pointing outwards and your mass flow rate's pointing inwards, those are 180 degrees apart. Cosine of 180 is negative one. So mass flow rate out of the system is positive, mass flow rate into the system is negative. And that's really weird and hard to remember. You'd think that adding to the system should be positive, but because of this dot product, it's actually opposite of that. So if I write out my equilibrium equation here, so I can ignore body forces because the weight is pointing down and I'm only interested in the horizontal. I have one surface force, that's friction pointing to the left. And on the right hand side, right, I crossed off MA, I crossed off the accumulation term because of steady flow. I'm only interested in the water entering and exiting. So I have three m dot v terms. And for each one, I'm going to be very particular about all of my signs because it's so easy to make a sign error on these problems. So for the inlet, m dot a v a, velocity is pointing to the right, so the velocity is positive, but m dot is going in. So based on that dot product, the mass flow rate itself is actually negative. So a positive term because it's to the right, but a negative term because it's going into the control volume. Exit B is going to the right with a cosine 60 degrees, so it's positive, and it's exiting, so mass flow rate B is also positive. For point C, the mass is leaving the system, which is the positive mass flow rate direction, but it's pointed to the left, which is the negative X direction, so the velocity term is negative, even though the mass term is positive. So seriously, what I'm doing here, where I'm writing like positive because it's out and negative because it's left, like write these down when you're writing down these equations also, it will help you keep track of your negative signs and help you try to maybe catch a mistake, right? Every m dot v term has two sign decisions that you need to make. One based on whether it's in or out, the other based on whether it's left or right. I think your TA Indy was a big help because this Reynolds transport theorem is extremely complicated. If you think some of this is starting to make a little bit of sense, then go ahead and hit the thumbs up button to let your TA Indy know that he's doing a good job and should keep it up. I'm giving him some of his churu treat because it's about the most adorable thing possible watching him lick up his little treat here. So it's super fun to watch and kind of hypnotizing, but we, we also got to get back to the problem, right? You can't just sit here all day. So let, let's finish this up. But good news is that the engineering part of this problem is, is basically completely done. At this point, we're just kind of solving for velocities and masses. We're just plugging in numbers. So back to the problem, we need velocities at A, B, and C. And I already messed up once at the very beginning of this problem, not accounting for the moving control volume. So I'm gonna remember to account for it this time. So first I can find the velocity leaving the hose. So if volumetric flow rate is velocity times area, I can get 20.37 as the velocity of the water as it's leaving the hose. But if the control volume is moving away from the hose, 
then the velocity of the water as it crosses into the control volume will be a little bit slower. 20.37 minus two means velocity at A is only actually 18.37. And that's the velocity in reference to the control volume itself. That's the speed at which water is entering the control volume. Probably the number one mistake students would make for this problem, right, is not accounting for that difference between the two velocities. With that velocity though, I can find mass flow rate as A, rho AV, density times area times velocity. And notice that I'm not using the original Q at this point. I'm using the new velocity to come up with a new volumetric flow rate, the flow rate that actually enters the control volume, which is different than the flow rate leaving the hose. We weren't given density for this problem, so I'm assuming 1,000 kilograms per meters cubed, which is a reasonable number, and get about 36 kilograms per second, and that's reference to the moving control volume. If I had used the original 0.04 flow rate, I would get a mass flow rate here of 40, but since the speed is reduced, then mass flow rate is also reduced. Now for points B and C, we were given that 3 fourths goes one way and 1 fourth goes the other way, but that doesn't help us with area, right? We weren't given a diameter. Points A is on the same streamline as B and also on the same streamline as C, since flow goes from A to B and from A to C. A, B, and C are all at atmospheric pressure, so I can cross off the pressure term of Bernoulli's equation. And this is a vertical problem, so there is a change in height, but if I make a simplifying assumption that I can ignore the change in height, then that means that the velocity term at A has to equal the velocity term at B and also equal the velocity term at C. Again, not perfectly accurate since it doesn't account for the slight changes in elevation, but since we weren't actually given any dimensions as to how big this card is, we don't have any numbers to put in there anyway, so that's a reasonable enough assumption. And if all the velocities are the same, that is gonna make it a little bit easier. So since I know that three fourths of the volumetric flow rate goes to B and one fourth goes to C, the mass flow rate also splits. Three fourths of it goes up to B, one fourth of it goes down to C. And with that, it's time to plug all the numbers back into the original equilibrium equation. Your TA Andy's not gonna be able to help us out from here. He's in his snack coma, so it's totally nap time. Once he finishes a churu, he, he's out, right? Let's see if we can make him proud. Plug in all the mass flow rates and velocities, get about 497 newtons as the friction force that's acting on this cart. And it seems like I'm ready to celebrate because after all of this, this huge Reynolds transport theorem problem, I got to a final answer for F. But I scroll back up, what was I even trying to find in this problem? It wasn't force, we were actually trying to find power. But good news, power is just force times velocity. So the amount of force acting on the cart is basically, since it's not accelerating, is just exactly compensating for the friction force. And the velocity is the velocity of the cart. So the 497 times two is about 994 watts. And that's how much power the, the stream of water from the nozzle is exerting on the cart, mostly to overcome friction and keep it moving at that constant two meters per second velocity. Next video you see linked up on the screen is gonna be momentum with an accelerating control volume. Seems like it should be a lot more complicated, but it's only a small amount more complicated, right? You just can't cross off the MA term. So it's mostly the same as this problem, but you have that one extra term to account for acceleration.